still remember how to do this. Good afternoon and thanks so much for joining in. Yesterday my office announced that a member of the governor's office tested positive for COVID-19. I'm not a close contact of this individual and I've not been in sustained in-person contact with this individual in the last two weeks. Close contact is any individual that's been within six feet of an infected person for a total of 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period. Out of an abundance of caution, I took a test yesterday as well as today and received negative results. I'll continue to be regularly tested over the next few days. Lieutenant Governor Cooney was also tested yesterday and tested negative again today. Yesterday, we also announced that there are four staffers in the governor's office who are considered close contacts at this time. Did we lose it? Or, no, that's okay, good. Since then, uh, we've received test results back. One additional staffer who was one of the four considered a close contact with a positive um, and under quarantine tested positive as well. I'm also not considered a close contact of this individual. The positive, of, uh, positive test of that second individual led to adding one additional close contact from the governor's office. So we have six staff in total uh, impacted under quarantine or isolation, two of whom are positive and four of whom have tested negative. All six staff will stay under quarantine or isolation if positive for the recommended 14 day period. We have and continue to take this virus very seriously in the governor's office. Masks are a requirement for our staff and for visitors. Since the beginning of the pandemic, nurses take temperature checks on all staff each morning. And if a staff member has a fever, they're sent home. We follow the guidelines and restrictions we have in place, avoid large gatherings, keep social circles small, and stay home when sick. Unfortunately, as we've seen time and time again throughout these past eight months, this virus can impact anyone. We've implemented and are following the guidelines and restrictions to do everything we can to minimize the risk of transmission. While it's certainly unfortunate that these two staffers tested positive, we can see that the precautions we have in place made for minimal close contacts of the positive individuals. And because the individuals followed masking requirements, limited gatherings, kept social circles small, and stayed home as soon as they were experiencing symptoms, there are only four close contacts in our office who are now under quarantine. These individuals followed the guidelines, got tested quickly, began isolation, and those positive tests initiated the process of notifying known contacts to begin their quarantine. And thankfully, these individuals stayed home after experiencing symptoms, likely preventing what would have resulted in potential further spread around the office. Keeping your group sizes small also assists with contact tracing efforts. And with masking up and following other precautions like sanitation and disinfection in the governor's office, it's our hope that this virus will be contained. We know that the virus can take time to incubate. And while neither Lieutenant Governor Cooney or I are considered close contacts, we will continue to get tested regularly over the next few days and closely monitor for any symptoms. Well, it certainly is not ideal that a staff member tested positive, or two rather, and we're keeping them in our thoughts. It's a reminder that we all must continue to take this virus very seriously. I also announced yesterday that we've secured five teams with five nurses on each team 
from the U.S. Department of Public Health and Human Services requested to assist us for 30 days with filling in the gap of the health care worker shortage in rural areas. With the increasing number of COVID-19 cases across Montana, this increases the likelihood of health care workers becoming infected with the virus or having to quarantine for, for being a close contact. Our critical access hospitals play a fundamental role in assisting our state's efforts in caring for patients in rural areas with COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 related issues. By making sure that we can help manage staffing needs, we'll not only ensure that those rural hospitals stay open, but also prevent patients from having to be transferred to higher care facilities that would take up more bed space in urban areas or urban hospitals of the state. Three of the five teams will arrive uh, mid next week and will be stationed along the High Line and Eastern Montana to serve in critical access hospitals that may be experiencing staffing shortages. The following two teams will arrive after they finish a response to Hurricane Zeta. The state's emergency coordination center will take the lead on operations. There is no doubt that COVID-19 is widespread throughout Montana. No matter where we live, in a rural or in an urban area of our state, we must continue to come together to find ways to manage this virus. And we must all be extra cautious in ensuring that we take precautions to spread to prevent the spread further in our communities. I'm pleased to see that some communities in the state have taken action to implement further restrictions, especially as these are some of the areas where we're seeing higher number volume of cases and are more populated. Cascade and Missoula counties have adopted measures that reduce capacity at establishments like bars and restaurants to 50% below the state's 75% capacity requirement. Cascade and Lewis and Clark County have limited size gatherings to 50 or fewer people. Missoula County has limited size gatherings to 25 people or fewer and implemented a bar close time of 10 p.m. I've always been supportive of local public health adopting further measures that they need to address the virus in their communities and that support continues to this day. It's my hope that the businesses and Montanans in those communities are supportive of these actions and follow these measures, particularly as we head into a holiday weekend. We are one big community in Montana. The virus doesn't always know boundaries and is spreading at times as if we are a big community, but we can also beat this virus and slow the spread by working together as a community. Here today with me are two guests from Butte, Gilbert and Gina, who recently recovered from the virus. I'd like to turn it now over to them to share their story. Thanks for being here, Gilbert and Gina. I'm Gilbert Herrera from Butte. Uh, before all this started, back in March, I was a firm believer in not wearing a mask. Um, I have a normally, normally normal healthy immune system, which you know most of the time prevents me from getting sick. And so, and I wound up calling this thing shamdemic. You know, it's going to go away after after the election's over with. You know, that was my firm belief. And then in September. 10th was when I started feeling symptoms, uh, hot and cold, and just couldn't shake the fevers or anything. So um, for the next week, I worked as normal, sick as a dog, you know, could barely even perform my duties until the following Friday, I went and got tested. When I got tested, they quarantined me right away and so I pretty much sat home for another week. So the next following Friday, um, I wasn't feeling that great. I got up and just kind of laid on the couch. 
And about an hour later, I couldn't breathe. I felt like my chest was constricted, um, my breaths were shallow, and things were starting to go black. So I called my wife, who was already in the hospital for this, and she had called her daughter to come downstairs and get me, and um, she had coordinated with the staff at the hospital to be ready for me when we got there, which thankfully we only lived two blocks away. So when our daughter came downstairs to take me, I could see the fear in her eyes that, you know, she was scared, you know, for what was happening to me. So she got me down to the car, and by the time I got to the car, I started feeling like everything was starting to go black. And, you know, uh, she got me in the car and got me over to the hospital, which the staff was waiting for me pretty much right outside. Took me right in, and within 20 minutes, I was back to breathing partially normal. Uh, then they decided that, you know, since all of my vitals and everything were low, that they went ahead and, you know, admitted me in the hospital and put me up in the COVID wing. Um, they started giving me the treatments, same treatments that the president has been getting. And inside of three days, my vitals went from really bad to extremely good. And the doctors finally decided to release me. So I went home and pretty much waited it out until uh, my wife got released and tried to get better. Um, I wound up recovering fairly well. Uh, the only problems that I have is now I have uh, fluid in my lungs, which the doctors are kind of scared that it might be, um, you know, possible blood clot. So now I'm on blood thinners for the rest of my life. This virus does not care who you are. Doesn't care what color you are, doesn't care, you know, if you're clean, dirty, or whatever. If you're gonna get sick, it's gonna get you. Um, now, I'm a firm believer in wearing the masks because I just don't want to see anybody else go through what we had to deal with. Thank you. So my name is Gina Sandin. Gilbert and I are married. So I started showing symptoms the next day after him, September 11th, but they were very mild, kind of just like a simple, kind of a throat clearing cough. I didn't get really sick until the 16th. And then um, on the 18th of September, I was short of breath, coughing, coughing very hard. I had body aches, symptoms more like the flu. And I, to be honest, I thought I had the flu based on the chart of symptoms. Gilbert had different symptoms than me and our daughter had even different symptoms from either of us. And she also tested positive as well. Um, so I went into the doctor on the 18th. I called ahead to say, you know, can you guys test for the flu and coronavirus? They said that they could test for both. They could hear me coughing, but they still asked if I was symptomatic, and I said yes. So I went in, and they pretty much right away diagnosed me with pneumonia um, and tested me for COVID, and this was on a Friday. Um, on, they said that I should get my test back by Saturday, I did not have test results back by Saturday, nor did I have them back by Sunday. On Sunday, I was dizzy, delirious. I couldn't stand without getting nauseous. Um, it just wasn't good. So I asked my daughter to Google when should a person go to the emergency room for pneumonia, and basically everything that she read was, yeah, we're going. And even then, he's like, well, they're just going to send you home. Um, so we get to the, to the hospital, and so emergency rooms, I don't know if anybody spent any amount of time in emergency room, but they have soft rooms, which are just curtains, and hard rooms, which is a full door. So they were getting ready to put me in a soft room when somebody shouts out, stop, she's COVID positive. This was the first time me or anyone knew that any of us in the family had COVID. The nurse turns to me, she goes, well, you could have told us. And I'm like, now hold on a minute. <laughs> when you learned, it was the exact moment I learned, and I'm trying not to panic, 
But I'm also at that point was delirious. And um, they put me in the emergency room and put me on oxygen. And pretty much the minute I got on oxygen, things started to clear and I felt better. And when I went to the, when I got into the ER, my oxygen was in the lower 70s, which is not good. (laughs) Um, So they're like, we're going to admit you. We're going to give you the five day run of the antivirals, which is the usual run, the remdesivir. And, but I had to wait in the emergency room for four hours because um, COVID patients are put in what they call negative pressure rooms. Basically, your air stays in your room and it's basically, it doesn't, so you don't infect other people. And the nurses have to gown up every time they come in, they leave their gowns and everything that they brought in in the room when they leave. So in Butte, St. James Hospital only has two of those rooms. One was being occupied by a non-COVID patient, one was being occupied already by one COVID patient. Um, So they had to basically prepare me a room that didn't exist. And and that was interesting because it blocked out my window. I had no way to look outside. Um, they talked to me through video monitor. Um, you know, normally you call the nurse on the call button, they come in, they couldn't do that. They talked to me through the monitor and because they had to gown up every time they came in, they just needed to know what I needed so that they could make sure they had everything because not like, oh, I forgot something. Let me just run back out and get it. Um, so the first night they started me on the remdesivir the antiviral that's the same one that the president got and did well on and my husband did well on as well but i actually was allergic to it Um, the first night i had hives and so they stopped it right away they had it remdesivir is not yet approved by the fda but they got emergency approval to give COVID patients who've been hospitalized this antiviral. And so they had to consult the study to determine if I could still potentially proceed with the antivirals. They determined that I probably could proceed if I took a run of Benadryl 45 minutes prior to the run of the antivirals and if we slowed down the antivirals. Normally, the antivirals are administered over a course of 30 minutes. In my case, they decided to slow down the IV drip and do it over a course of two hours. My first, normally remdesivir is a five day run. People who do well on it, they can get less days. I did fine with the addition of those procedures because the allergy on the first four days. However, on the fifth day I had a different nurse and that nurse only read the pharmacy's instructions, not the previous nurse and that the notes that I personally wrote in regard to the procedures. So she gave me Benadryl 15 minutes prior and just left it at the 30 minute run and I had an anaphylactic reaction to the remdesivir. After that, my white cell count spiked to over 20,000. Normal's in the 4,500 to 7,000-ish range. Um, And it turned out I had sepsis. Um, And the statistic that I read, and I'm no expert, but that coronavirus aside, one-third of people who develop sepsis die. So I ended up being in the hospital for 11 days. Um, and my white cell count, originally they told me my white cell count had to be below 10,000, but it went down to under 14,000. So I did get out of the hospital. However, so I was in the ho- I went into the hospital September 20th. I got out of the hospital on September 30th and I did not get out of isolation until last week. So I spent 45 days in isolation. And there's a difference between isolation and quarantine. So isolation, I'm gonna backtrack. Quarantine basically is that you've come in close contact with somebody who tested positive. And so now you have to stay in your own location, at your home or wherever the health department designates for 14 days and they give you an end date. When you are in isolation, basically, It's like a court order. You cannot leave your isolation location. And there's a penalty if you leave that location. It's up to a $500 fine 
or 90 days in prison or both, or in jail, I guess, not prison. Um, and each separate time you're out of your location is a different offense. So with isolation, they don't give you an end date. It's basically until we determine that you are not are no longer contagious. So that did not happen until last week. Um, this whole time, I have been very much pro mask wear. You can see my mask matches my outfit. Um, I've made hundreds of masks and give, given them away. Um, I, in fact, my purse is filled <laughs> with masks. Um, it, it kind of irritated me that my husband was anti-mask wearer. Um, so I felt like making all the masks was kind of my penance for... <laughs> I love him. We still love each other. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I've been teleworking this whole time. So I haven't really had any contact outside of the house. So, and we have, we're not trying to, we don't place blame on anyone in the household. It could have came from anyone. I did go out to go grocery shop, shopping. I did wear a mask. My daughter works in fast food. You know, any one of us, we don't know where it originated. And that's really the, the big thing is that people have asked us, well, how'd you get it? We don't know. We did the contract tracing just like everyone else, but you can't pinpoint this. It could be anywhere. And I stayed home all the time, and I still got it the worst of anyone. So that's my story. Thank you, uh, Gilbert and Gina, for sharing um, your story and your experience uh, with COVID-19. I'll now open it up for questions. Uh, in addition to myself, Gilbert and Gina, we have Jim Murphy here, uh, the head of the Infectious Disease Bureau, and also Dr. Greg Holzman. If you have a question, press five star. Say that your hand's raised. If your question's answered, you can press five star again. And um, that would then demonstrate that, or it'll move your hand back down. First phone question. Hi there. Um, this is Marisa from NBC Montana. Thanks so much for holding this. My question is for Gilbert. Has this experience um, changed your mind and, and how do you feel now when you see other people calling this a shamdemic or a pandemic? Well, I am a firm believer in it now, uh, especially after what it did to me. Um, you know, I was the type of person that I would mask shame people. You know, I would laugh at them because they were wearing it. And, you know, now from what I went through, yes, I am now a firm believer in it because I would just rather play it safe. Uh, thanks. Next phone question. Hi, yes, uh, this is Casey Elliott at the Bill and Tribune. I just wanted to ask if you would be willing to share with us if uh, Gilbert or Gina or both uh, your age group and if you had any underlying health conditions. It's up to you guys. Yeah. I'd say 22 for both of you. <laughs> so, um, this is Gina. I am 44. Uh, my daughter just turned 22. Uh, my daughter has two heart conditions, but I, I had a, a little high blood pressure, and that's, it's kind of borderline whether I need to take medication for it or not. And I just turned 51 here just a few days ago. Uh, and like I said, normally I've always just been an extremely healthy person. Uh, I don't even call off work. Uh, the only thing that I've had recently was high blood pressure. But since this has happened, I've changed my eating habits. 
and I haven't had to take my blood pressure meds for almost two months now. I can now keep my blood pressure normal just by watching what I eat. Next phone question. Hi. Hi, this is Rachel Kramer with Yellowstone Public Radio News. I uh, had a question for Gilbert and Gina and then also Governor Bullock. Um, Gilbert and Gina, I was curious, are you, are you concerned about um, long-term health effects from this? I think, Gilbert, you mentioned that you might need to take blood thinners the rest of your life. Well, I don't know if they'll be exactly the rest of my life, just how my doctor put it is until she decides I'm ready for another CT scan so they can make sure. Uh, but yeah, okay. it definitely affected us really, really pretty bad. So this is Gina. Um, although I have recovered from COVID, I am still recovering from the pneumonia and sepsis. Um, I did read a little bit of a scary statistic in regard to the sepsis, uh, that uh, most people die within three years, even if they recovered the first time from sepsis. Um, so that makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, I'm gonna have to do a little bit more research into that. But as also, um, I returned to teleworking on this Monday and I found that I'm still, you know, after 45 days of being ill, that I feel like I'm a little bit foggy in the brain, like I can't quite think the way I used to before, that it takes me a little bit more to connect the dots, and uh, hopefully that will go away. Hopefully it's not permanent. Thank you both for sharing your stories. And Governor Bullock, I had a question about um, something that came out yesterday. The FBI and two federal agencies warned that malicious groups are targeting the healthcare sector with attacks designed to lock up hospital information systems. And so I was wondering, has the state received any guidance to thwart such attempts? And um, have there been previous attacks, cyber attacks on Montana hospitals before? Uh, I'm not aware of previous um, attacks on Montana hospitals before. Uh, when I heard about it, we got a hold of both the Montana All Threats, Intelligence Center, Matic, to hear what they've learned and also uh, worked on making sure that we had a cyber team with the National Guard um, prepared if anything happens and we'll probably try to do some educational work in addition to what uh, the federal agencies are doing with the hospital system. Thank you. Next phone question. Hi, this is uh, Juliana Seagut from the Bowling Skidbrook. Um, Governor Willick, I had a question about those teams of nurses. Um, I was wondering if you know the specific locations where they're being sent and how long they'll be there for. So we don't know the uh, specific location yet. I mean, we're continuing to work through the uh, State Emergency Coordinating Council. Uh, one team, though, we're looking at sending the High Line and two to Eastern Montana and to fill in sort of gra gaps in critical access hospitals in those areas. Uh, also having to determine where the other two teams will be deployed. Uh, the full duration, is it 30 days? Is 30 days per team is what? we're anticipating right now. Please. Governor Bullock, Zach Kaplan, ABC Fox, Montana. At your last press conference, you talked a little bit about Halloween and some of the uh, uh, recommendations and such. Are you planning at this time to put in any additional restrictions with trick-or-treating and with people out and about this weekend? So we will, much to the, uh, I guess, um, dismay of my kids because typically like we give out about 2,000 candy bars and shut down the streets around uh, the governor's residence but so we won't be having that this time I know that uh, the community of whitefish is an example put in some restrictions just for this weekend 
Um, I don't intend on putting out any restrictions for the weekend, but I would counsel people based on also not just what you heard earlier in this week, but what you're hearing from the Center of Disease for con Control to be really careful on a holiday weekend and don't go to large parties. And if you're giving out candy, do it in as safe a way as possible. And there's actually at the CDC guidance, our website, some guidance on that. Governor Jonathan Amberian, Montana Television Network. Uh, the Garfield County Health Department, they put out a post on Facebook a few days ago saying that in the next start of next month, they were expecting a new state tracking system to come into effect. I was curious if you were able to give us any more uh, information about what that's going to entail. I'll bet Jim Murphy will. The, the state health department has worked very closely with all the local health departments in Montana to try to keep the numbers of cases, recovered cases, deaths, and hospitalizations all synced up. As everybody understands, with the volumes that are being reported, uh, it's hard to keep those numbers always matching. So we were looking for better ways to do that. What we're doing is we're trying to move all the jurisdictions we work with over to a more centralized, reportable disease database that we've had in place for some time. So we're changing the way that we track COVID a little bit that way to a, a different database that we have had for uh, several years with the idea that that will sync up better for the local health departments, better for the state. If a number doesn't match then on the uh, state dashboard, it won't be because our repis didn't connect with the local public health nurse. It will be because they're not up to date at the local system um, and we pull from that system. So I think that this will bring the numbers into much better alignment. Uh, we're gradually kind of moving over to this as we work to clean up what is a large database uh, with over 30,000 COVID cases in it now. Uh, it, it's a big ordeal at the local level when they're challenged with case investigations that are coming in as quickly as they can, always to keep all that data as up to date as we would all like it. The priority at the local level is always going to be the case investigations and the contact tracing. Reconciling with the state, that's going to come a little bit further on down the line. This is going to make that process smoother, and we hope to end a lot of the discrepancies that we've seen over the past few months. Hey, Governor Bullock. This is uh, Josh Margolis calling in from New Media Broadcasters. I was wondering if um, I, uh, either, I guess either you or, or any of those uh, people with you could speak to this, but if you guys are planning or considering putting out maybe a database of specific long-term or assisted living facility, um, like by facility, how many cases uh, and so forth for, for the public. Thank you. So, so with respect to reporting in long-term care and assisted living facilities, there is already a summary that we do put out uh, that's updated at least every other week in the EPI profile available on the dphhs.mt.gov website. It doesn't provide as much detail as our school-based report, uh, but it does provide quite a bit of detail about you know, what kind of outbreaks are going on out there in congregate settings. And this includes the long-term care, um, it includes um, jail facilities as well. Uh, right now, that's been the detail that most people have been after and has worked fairly well. Next phone question. Uh, phone number ending in 991. I'm sorry, had to unmute the unmute button. Uh, this is Renee Jean from the Sydney Herald. I have a question for Gina. Was the sepsis caused by COVID or, and was the pneumonia caused by COVID? Were those both complications that arose because of COVID? And for uh, her husband, I'd like to know what he would like to tell people who are continuing to mask shame people for wearing masks. What would he tell them to convince them to stop doing that? So 
they don't really know if it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg. If I had pneumonia first and ANSEPS, or and COVID simultaneously, or if the COVID caused the pneumonia, or if the pneumonia made me more susceptible to COVID, and then whether the sepsis was caused by the pneumonia or the COVID. So it's, it's really a what came first, the chicken or the egg sort of question. There's no real answer to that. Okay, thank you. And for your husband, if he could talk to us a little about what would he say to convince those who are against masks to reconsider? Well, I've already gotten into arguments with a few people um, over it. You know, they, it's just people that don't really care about your story. They don't care what you, you know, you went through. You're still going to have those people that are just going to um, not wear them. You know, I myself do, you know, find myself getting upset when I don't see people wearing them. You know, unlike before, you know, in March or up and, you know, until just recently, you know, I didn't care about the mask and, you know, now I do. You know, I talk to people, you know, I tell them, you know, hey, be safe, wear your mask. But, you know, you're always going to have those people that just, you know, don't want to do it, don't care about it. You know, they just think they're, they can't get sick and they're just, you know, it's nothing for them. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank uh, Gilbert and Gina for sharing their story. Uh, and this is not the first time that I've heard from Montanans about how this disease has impacted their lives. And I've spoken to Montanans and too many families that have lost loved ones because of this disease. As Gilbert noted, this is not a shamdemic. And it is something that we all can take a bit more seriously. It's something that it's incumbent upon us as a community, as people that care about our friends and neighbors and loved ones, to take the actions that we know can make a difference in curbing the spread of this virus. I hope that you appreciate both Gilbert and Gina's bravery in speaking about what occurred to them and the continuing impacts. And while you may have, we may have frustrations that COVID-19 is still with us, and as I've said, that we're all fatigued of it. Keep in mind folks like them and folks all over the state that don't want to be spending certainly weeks or days in the hospital that don't want to be wondering if there is going to be continuing impacts and effects, and that don't want to have further losses of lives, because it is incumbent on each of us to do our part as individuals to better protect the community. Thanks so much.